Today on Vinu Diladon, there has been a whole genre of physics toys that I have been neglecting to talk about for years. Gyroscopes. If you're watching this video, then most likely at some point in your life, you have already seen a gyroscope in action, or have played with one yourself, and they're really interesting devices. From an engineering standpoint, there's not much mechanically to them. The most important part of a gyroscope is, of course, the flywheel, which is the usually circular mass that rotates on an axis like this. Now. The basic premise of a gyroscope is that the portions of mass on the flywheel want to keep going in the same direction. So for example, if the wheel's rotating this way, this portion of mass wants to continue going this direction. This portion of mass here wants to continue going in this direction. And then of course, uh, when we apply torques to the flywheel, interesting things happen, which gives us the field of gyroscopics. So, Let's go ahead and see one of the most easily demonstrated features of a gyroscope, and that is precession. Now, with the gyroscope still like this, of course it falls down, no problem, because gravity is pulling it that way. To start the gyroscope, I am going to go ahead and use this rotary tool. It has a little rubber nub on it. And give it a good amount of speed. I think we can go uh, the maximum on this. That's dangerous. And if I let it go, we see the effects of uh, gyroscopic precession in action. Now, as I said, this is an unpowered gyroscope and of course needs an external mechanical force applied to it to get it going. Well, I want to talk more in this video about do-it-yourself power gyroscopes and I've made a few so this one I call the gyrangle and if I touch the two contacts here you can see it spin up same thing with this little gyroscope I built and uh, this uses the uh, motor stator mechanism from a uh, pancake VCR motor it has two little lithium ion cells if I turn it on we can see it start up and uh, I really just have found uh, computer DC brushless fans to make very good gyroscope frames. Not only because you have a, a brushless uh, motor that doesn't have a commutator, uh, but also you have a nice frame to put your batteries around. So this is the one that I put together. And it does pretty much the same thing as our unpowered gyroscope here. So let's go ahead and turn this on. We'll let it start up. We'll move this one off the string. And this one is astonishingly quiet. I mean, it's like, no sound. It's, it's quiet. I'm going to put it on the post and uh, we'll see 
how this one behaves in contrast to the uh, the unpowered gyroscope. You ready? Just like that. Does the same thing. And well, this is a technical channel, and I found powered gyroscopes to be actually more difficult to build than I thought. So in this video, I'm going to discuss some design considerations for you, so that way you can build your own gyroscope that's powered at home easily and effectively. Every physics fan should have a gyroscope, especially a powered gyroscope. I mean, these, these things are just, they're, they're so much fun. And they're magical. They really are magical devices. So that's what we're going to do in this video. We're going to uh, discuss powered gyroscopes. Wow, that tip is digging into my finger. Now because this is a video about power gyroscopes, we'll have to select what I call a winner winner flywheel spinner. And in order to help with that, I want to discuss three different types of electric motor. The first type I want to discuss is the DC brushed motor. And these have some advantages and disadvantages. Now, some of the advantages are they're easy to find and easy to use. They usually just have two uh, electrical connections. You hook up your battery or whatnot, and they spin. Then another advantage is they have great low speed starting torque. So normally they'll start a flywheel up pretty quickly. Now to discuss some of the disadvantages, I want to go over what's inside of one of these electric motors. As soon as I open it up, almost, here we go. And on the inside, we can see the armature and the point that feeds electricity into the armature. And so on this side, we have these little metal fins. These are called brushes. And they make contact with what's called the commutator. The so commutator ring has these fins of metal that are the electrical connection to these three electromagnets on the armature. Well, one thing to note is when these motors are starting up, they often draw more current than they do when they're running underneath their normal conditions. So, uh, when the uh, when the mass of the flywheel is starting up, if it takes a while, it can often put additional stress on the brushes um, and the motor and burn it out quicker. Another disadvantage is most of these motors do not have true roller bearings or ball bearings inside, but instead have oil impregnated bronze bushings. You can see one of them underneath the brushes there. And on this side, you can see another oil impregnated bronze bushing. So they're not the best, but they do work pretty well. I'll show you that. I have one of these little DC brush motors from a uh, CD-ROM drive. And for my flywheel, I have the flywheel from a cassette player. So I'll feed some power into that. Spin it up. And of course, you just connect a little like lithium ion battery up to this and It'll uh, work pretty well. Go ahead and give that some, some speed and power. Not touch the flywheel. And sure enough, pretty crude gyroscope. So not much to using one of these brushed DC motors. The second type of motor I want to discuss is the brushless motor that's found inside of a computer blower fan. So, one of the things you want to watch out for is something with high power. They want a high wattage. Let's take a look at the numbers here and figure out what the wattage is. We can see it's 12 volts and at 0.22 amps. So not a full amp, but a quarter of an amp. So a quarter times 12, that would give us roughly 3 watts. So let's see what the performance of this fan is. Go ahead and put power into that. Spin it up, go ahead and touch that. There's not much power behind that at all. Oh, another thing to watch out for is that some fans don't want to start if you put a lot of weight on them. That's just to prevent them from burning out and something built into the uh, fan motor controller. Well, let's take a look at a fan that's much smaller. Well, we can take a look at the wattage on that. And what we have here is 12 volts once again at a little over an, a half an amp. So, we'll do the rough math on here and say this gives us about 6 watts. So about double the power of the fan that I just showed you. We'll go ahead and put power in here. And I'm sure you'll see that there's a bit of a difference between the two. Right away, already louder 
and uh, blowing more air. And I don't want to touch that fan. There are some other considerations to take into account when you're using the brushless motors from computers like this. Let's take a look at the uh, physical build of the fan as well. So we can see here that it has the uh, post for the um, for the rotor. And it's just in the plastic like that. So not structurally that strong. And there's no ball bearings in here. So probably also just the oil impregnated bronze bushings or the uh, maglev bearings. But uh, the ones you really want to watch out for are the ones that are metal here and have ball bearings, especially two ball bearings. And that's because they can take the lateral force a bit better. Let's take a look at a couple of things I want to show you. And we got uh, a couple of things here. So this is what's inside of one of those fans. You see that there's a bearing here. If I flip it over, there's another bearing in there. And the nice thing about ball bearings like this is unlike the, the bushings, they can take a fair bit of lateral force like this and not fail. Whereas uh, sometimes the bushings will fail pretty quickly. Uh, and you'll hear these, they go when you got a, a failing computer fan. Quite annoying. Um, let's take a look at these two right here. Now these have some structural advantages. They're fully metal here and the plastic fan blade assembly sits on the top. But even these two are a little different. Well, you'll notice that this one is just a piece of sheet steel that's been pressed and stamped. And of course, it really doesn't have any kind of structure to it. So if there's any kind of wobble over the long duration, it has a tendency of getting loose in that section. And then, of course, it just pops off. Whereas we take a look at this, we can see that there actually is another embedded section of what appears to be brass. And that far more structural than just the regular stamped uh, sheet metal alone. So this right here, along with the two ball bearings and uh, high wattage, are what you're going to be looking for for the best performance from uh, one of these fans. And you know what? Let's go ahead and actually uh, plug this one in. Let's connect it up see how well it works. Might be a good, uh, a good fan. Uh, no, yeah, there's there's really not much torque there at all, is there? Um, rather disappointing. No, so that's no good. Take a look at this one, see how well it works. It's not as structurally sound, but maybe it has a little bit more wattage. Of course, we can always test it by the current going in the fan as well. You know, that's a little stronger, but I think that if we're going to make any kind of decision using a fan motor this one meets all the criteria that uh, would be best so not only is it a fairly high wattage fan but it also has a fully metal you know enclosed magnet has a nice reinforced uh, brass piece that's put in there probably also a dual ball bearing uh, I hope so it's also fairly thick which means the bearing should be spaced out pretty decently it's even thicker than this right here so uh, the further spaced out the bearings are um, the easier it's going to take that lateral torque like this um the last type of motor i want to discuss here is the three-phase motor so let's take a look at some of those the uh, easiest three-phase motor to find is uh, usually from a CD-ROM drive like this. If they still make them in your neck of the woods, kind of obsolete technology. Now, some of these motors don't want to pull apart very easy at all or be modified. They have some special voodoo in them that holds them together. But sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll find ones that pull apart pretty easy like this. Now, these also have advantages and disadvantages. A lot like the brush motors, they can have some pretty good starting torque. Uh, the disadvantages are on a lot of these is they don't have the ball bearings and you need a fancy electronic speed controller in most cases to run these. Now, I will say there is a simple circuit that uses like a, what, a one potentiometer, a six diodes, three MOSFETs, and maybe a couple of resistors that will also run these as well, but they have severe limitations. Those circuits do not do not give us the best option. It's best to use an ESC, but I might try to use um, these motors instead with one of those little simple how you doing drivers. 
looks pretty structural. Uh, I have two of them that uh, match. So, you know, we could probably put two motors on there and have our flywheel wedged between. So that would give us some power on both sides. Wow, that is not very center. Um, ah, I see, it is an obstruction. Okay, uh, so we'd have two motors giving us twice the power. So that's also something to consider. Um, but these aren't the easiest to use by any means. Uh, and if I go with the simple free MOSFET driver, I'll have to wire these up for star configuration and not uh, triangle delta configuration. Once again, there's limitations. Um, but the fan motors, they're great. If you're going to build your own power gyroscope, use these. I do want to make one thing very clear, and this is just from my own experience. So, I'm going to show you something here. You see this? Uh, this used to be a gyroscope in progress. Uh, this is where I learned that these are incredibly dangerous motors to use, especially for gyroscopes. So well, I'm going to show you something. Right on my hand here, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there is a scar that goes across this way. Well, that's because I was holding this and I was driving it with an electronic speed controller at about 18 or so volts. Uh, and I had this thing going, I want to say at about, what, uh, 20,000 RPM, 7,200 normal. So a little over double the speed of what these are rated for. Now there is one major concern to watch out for. And if you have any experience with any kind of clutch or any kind of drum brake system, you're going to instantly get why this is so dangerous. I want to point out something. Now, if you take a look at where the rotor spins and this section right here there is hardly any space and this goes down about another four millimeters inside of this uh this host for the uh the magnetic assembly here um well what ended up happening is that i got the motor going so fast that the uh the aluminum that was holding the ceramic bearing gave way and it expanded outwards now of course that acted like a clutch and put all of the power of the five or so platters of the gyroscope into the outside of the frame. Of course, this spun the frame like this. Now, even though it had cut my finger significantly badly and I was bleeding all over and making a profuse mess with my own bodily fluids, uh, the thing that caught me off guard was that it was spinning so fast, the wires that were connected to the electronic speed controller went supersonic. It sounded like a firework blew off in my hand. Similar results too. Um, but yes, uh, these motors are quite dangerous. Um, they're also quite dangerous too because if you tilt them um, like this, it can put flex on the uh, axle and uh, it can also make contact that way. So if you're gonna make any kind of super high speed gyroscope, super high speed project, be mindful of these motors they can clutch up right away. Oh, a funny anecdote while I remember. Uh, my friend Damien, um, he had uh, a hard drive failing in his computer catastrophically. So he calls me up one day, he goes, Patrick, my computer made a bang sound and knocked itself over. I says, what? That's the how? Well, I got over to his you know, place. I listened to the hard drive and it, it didn't spin up or anything else like that. So I decided to take it apart. Well, the bearing had seized and he had one of those hard drives that had say, uh, three or four platters on the inside. Well, once again, uh, when it locked up, all the force that was stored in the platters was delivered to the outside of the hard drive and it kicked over like this, which hit the side of his computer with so much force, it dented it and knocked it over. Uh, re really freaky occurrence, but yeah, um, don't trust these motors, they're not the best. Um, the safer alternative is to try to use something maybe like this or from a drone. Um, very simple uh, three-phase motor to use. This one is from a projector. It held the color wheel on it, but it's much safer because you don't have any kind of risk of that spreading out and causing any kind of clutch um, action happening. So safer motor than an outer um, race. Same thing like this. It can't, uh, can't clutch out against anything. So something to consider. All things to consider for choosing um, your motor. Um, yeah, with that said, let's go into discussing flywheels.
At this point, I have two DC brushless motors already selected and pretty much prepared for a flywheel. All I have to do is figure out now what I'm going to use as my flywheel. So with that in consideration, I want to show you two different objects. Both of them are about 45 millimeters in diameter. Both of them are made of steel. This one right here is a washer. And this one right here is a stack of steel laminated sections from a stepper motor. So you can see where that went in. Now there are three things to consider for your um, gyroscope flywheel properties. The first one is this speed, second one is the material density, and then the third one is the material distribution. So we can already see some differences. Of course the material density is going to be about the same, they're both steel. The distribution of the material is different though. Then we can take a look here, we can see that the distribution is pretty even, um, going from the inside to the outside. But this isn't. We have these cutouts here, a lack of material, with most of the uh, material mass distributed along the outside area here. Now what about their weight? Well, let's figure what that is. The one here is about 20 grams. This one is about 30 grams. So, uh, this one is two-thirds the weight of this one. So yeah, which one of these objects would be a better flywheel? Well, let's discuss flywheels a little bit more. The most easiest flywheel to find is just your basic disc like this. I got three discs here. And I found that washers aren't really the best, but what I found works really well, actually, is if you get the one uh, disc from a speaker magnet, like a subwoofer, this is from one of those, um, they make pretty hefty flywheels, so pretty easy to find those if you uh, collect speaker junk. Well, let's take a look at these three flywheels, um, or discs. This one is a aluminum um, hard drive platter, so we're going to take a look at it. Uh, the evenness of the uh, material density uh, or whatnot, distribution is pretty much the same all the way through. Um, same thing with all of these, even uh, material density distribution. 23 grams, so that's fairly light, um, but it has a lot of the mass on the outside. It's pretty wide, so for this flywheel, you have to spin it up pretty fast in order to get significant um, gyroscopic effects. Let's take a look at this one. It's about the same uh, physical size as the platter here, but what's the weight on this? About 90 grams, so about, about 3.5 times heavier. So, in order to get the same gyroscopic effects from this lighter plate, lighter disc, you would uh, spin this one slower. Uh, you get more uh, gyroscopic effects at a slower rotation speed. And you have this one right here. Well, what's uh, the, what's the weight on this one? About 70. So, these two are pretty close weight. Now this one is smaller in diameter and uh, that means that in order to get the same uh, gyroscopic effects from this one as you would this one, you need to spin this one faster because you don't have the material towards uh, a wider diameter further away from the central point. Anybody who's been in a miracle round will know that if you're in the center, you hardly feel any of the effects, but the further out you go, the more you want to feel uh, that sensation of being thrown off the merry-go-round hole. Same thing happens here. Uh, the further out from center your weight is, the better. And uh, you can see that in many different, um, in many different um, flywheel masses. This is a, another uh, convenient thing to use with the flywheel, um, and it has the magnet and the folded over uh, stamp seal section. A lot of mass on the outside. Fairly easy to mount on many motors. Good if you don't have anything else laying around. Let me show you some of the uh, pre-built gyroscopes again. And maybe you'll notice something that they all have in common. We'll take these three. Now, you'll notice on the uh, VHS uh, VCR read head mechanism that we have a raised outside edge along the periphery of the flywheel. So we got more mass along the outside. Uh, once again, the characteristic we want to see. 
using this stator section from one of these pancake motors in a VCR. Um, once again, we have a bit of mass on the outside. So well, that's nice. It's even uh, even more narrow here. These plates um, that have the mounting screw holes. Not all the plates are like that. Some of them go down further and uh, they're hollow. So even less mass there. So excellent. And then this, you'll notice I left the copper on this one. Um, the reason why I left the copper on is because copper adds additional weight. It's a fairly heavy material. And of course, it's on the outside of the flywheel um, radius. Uh, you can also see what I mean. So you see how many stacks there are here um, versus the, what, two of them here? No, that's what I mean. Less, uh, less of these disc um, laminated steel sections actually have these screw, these three um, holes. So yeah, very, very good flywheel to use, very efficient. Um, so let me show you what I've selected for my flywheels that I think I'm going to use. And those would be this and this. Now, I mean, uh, let's see what the mass is on this. Let's see. Uh, they're like about 90-ish. 88. That's uh, significantly lighter. Maybe like half the weight. Oh, well, more than I thought. It's about 60. Okay, so this one weighs two thirds as much as this one does, uh, roughly. So I have to spin this one faster, but this one is going to be our more efficient flywheel because we have more of the mass on the outside. And uh, the less mass you have, the faster you can spin the motor. That's just the way it is. But uh, yeah. I think this is going to be the best one. This is going to be a short second to use. Um, I did need to make an adapter coupler for this one. It works, so I spun that up on the lathe. Also, um, made the one side of this smoother. So that way I could put different weights and stuff on here if I wanted to add weight onto this flywheel. Motors. Where would my motors go? Okay, let's see how these perform, actually. Oh, roughly, uh, go ahead and put that on. And these aren't going to be perfectly balanced. I'll tell you right away. In order to perfectly balance your flywheel, it takes forever. And this one needs a little bit more work because we've got the screw hole here. I'm going to need to put another hole here on this side to make sure it's perfectly balanced. But that's not important. Let's give it a quick spin. See how balanced it is. That's terrible. Let's see if we can get a better balance real quick. Yeah, kind of. Um, let's go ahead and uh, spin that up. See how you perform. Oh, she's off balance. That's okay, we'll spin it up anyway. It'll balance itself out through the magic of inertia. That's quite nice, actually. That's quite a bit of uh, gyroscopic force. Now that that's that's a keeper. Nope, no, we don't have the hybrid bay blades right now. Uh, let's go ahead and test this out. Get this balanced real quick. Good enough. It's not perfect, but good enough for a test run. Oh yeah, that's that's also fairly nice. Honestly, I think this is the one that I'm uh, most looking forward to using. That's picking up significant speed. Definitely faster than the other one. Not as torquey, but... Oh, yeah. It's still torquey. Both very good options. Both very good options. And to answer the question, 
about which uh, is a better gyroscope weight. I actually had really good luck with them. You'd think I wouldn't. There's only one downside um, because they're not perfectly round. There's quite a bit of air drag, um, which makes it not the most ideal. But as far as an easily accessible weight that you can put on something, spin around, you have stepper motors, they work pretty well. Go ahead and spin this up real quick. This is just on a uh, little laptop blower fan. Push this motor. Yeah. Not bad. Not the best, but not bad. These are great for little single lithium ion cell tiny pocket gyroscopes. Um, very similar to what I built with this, but yeah. So I think I'm going to mount these and balance them. And we'll come back to building a frame and discussing options for that. But so far, we have um, quite a few ideas already on the table and we have some good progress. So Before we get into design considerations for your DYI powered gyroscope, I want to show you a little trick when it comes to balancing your gyroscope. And that is detecting vibrations. Because an unbalanced gyroscope will make vibrations. So what you'll need is a fairly thin piece of material. This is just a uh, mirror. And you want to suspend it on two sides, so that way it can vibrate pretty freely. Now that should work. And then uh, it'll amplify the vibrations like a, a drum would. Um, anyway, listen for that as I discuss design considerations. So this is the first gyroscope that I made. It's a gyro angle. And all it has is um, five pieces of plastic. So two triangles and three sides. Holds the battery all in nice and neat. Um, what's interesting about this is it shows the gyroscope likes to remain in a fixed axis. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. And before it starts up, if we give it a little hit, oh, gyroscope action is already enabled. So a normal shape like this, if you hit it, fall over. But you can actually hit this with significant force, and it doesn't. So it shows how a gyroscope likes to keep its orientation. The downside about this design is the flywheel is really close to the plastic. The plastic's not that strong. So if I rock the gyroscope, you can hear the flywheel uh, rub up against the plastic. So keep in mind spacing with flimsy materials. I'll go ahead and turn that off. And by the way, listen to the vibration real quick. Don't make much noise. So, take this, put this off to the side. Let's take a look at this gyroscope right here. So, pretty similar design. This just uses two circular pieces of aluminum that I cut out. I think they were uh, laptop CD-ROM drives. And I use four standoffs and eight screws for this. Not much to it. Very simple to build. Both these designs have sides that you can mount, um, like a pin or a pivot on. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn this one on. We're going to hear some of the same uh, problems of the triangle here. So if I rotate it real quickly, uh, not as bad, a little bit more distance. So I can get it to rub. No, doing pretty good, actually. Put this on uh, the plate. He uh, does some weird stuff, as gyroscopes do. Take a look, listen to the vibration. You can already tell the balance on that not as good. You hear a little bit of rattle. Let's take a look at the last gyroscope that I built. So I turn that one off, which is the one I made using uh, the fan casing and housing. Uh, this is a nice design, but it lacks another side. So you have to find something to put on if you want to have a little pin like this sticking out of both sides go ahead and see how much vibration this design generates. It's pretty quiet, though it should also be quiet when we set it on the glass. Now this is a faster gyroscope, so make a little bit more vibration, but overall, pretty quiet. Yeah, that, that's excellently balanced that way. So yeah, these are all all good designs. 
So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a design similar to this. And instead of using four standoff, I'm going to use only three. As three is the minimum amount that we can have and have a stable surface. Um, and then I'll make probably a little section, a little disc with three more standoffs or something that'll extend out this way. Um, well, what about if you don't have any kind of fancy materials? Well, it's about as simple as you can make a gyroscope. So it just has a little DC motor in here. This screw right here offers us a leverage point. You can hang it on a string, and on this side we have our balancing point. This thing, um, let's see, it's powered by a little lithium ion cell. Simple switch. Not exactly balanced, but it's simple. It just uses a uh, container lid for the uh, outside and then two little caps. Um, and it works very nice, looks very nice. Not balanced. However, how well does it work? Let's put it on the string and find out. So uh, this is a good reminder that uh, just because you're using uh, simple materials and uh, everything is not exactly perfect, you can still get excellent results with the DIY uh, gyroscope out of simple things you can find around the house. Powered by bees. Angry bees. Yeah, I don't care what it's made out of. Uh, you know you want to play with this. Yeah, that is so cool. It really is just real cool. Uh, move it around. Stay there in the same, uh, same general axis. Look at that. Works real well. This thing will go pretty much until the batteries wear out. So, let's uh, get into building uh, our gyroscopes. Put that aside. Uh, and, oh, it's going to be horrible. Settle down. I'm going to show you the motors that I have here. So, this is um, one flywheel mounted and just about perfectly balanced. So, I'm going to show you that real quick. Turn that on. We're going to spin up the gyro to its full speed, so 12 volts in. We'll see how much vibration it makes. And you really hear the uh, air coming off that thing. That balance is so good. Let's go ahead and test the other one. So I did not drill a hole here. I actually used a screw and I cut the screw down to the exact length I needed it to match the weight over on this side. Of course because steel is heavier I did not need to fill up that hole as much but this also has a very good balance. Let's go ahead and spin this one up.
Now, it might not seem as balanced, but keep in mind that gyroscope has a round bottom. This one doesn't. That's quite nice. Get a closer look on that. Yeah, that's superb. Those are going to make great gyroscopes. All right, so now that we got an idea of what design we want to use for our gyroscope frame, which is going to be very similar to this, except using three standoffs, let's go ahead and start to design what the frame might look like. And we're going to start off with the flywheel in the middle. So let's go ahead and put that there. So that's our flywheel. You make sure that that's not obstructed. And uh, then I'm going to have two plates. So one plate is going to go along the side like this. And one plate is going to go along the side like this. Just like in uh, this design, I'm going to use three standoffs. So let's say there's one that we can't see that's obstructed by the flywheel. And then our other two standoffs are here. Now, like that. And then we're going to have... Uh, Two more plates that we can mount our needle point or string hanging implementation on. We gotta keep in mind that we also have where the motor actually mounts. So let's say we take a look at this. Our motor right here is probably gonna mount in like this. So that section. And then we're gonna probably mount the battery uh, pack on the other side like this. A little bit bigger than the motor mount. And then and then we can put our plates on there. So let's do a plate about this same size right here. Do a plate of that same size right here. And we'll do our standoffs. Let's see. One, two, three. The battery pack. We might need four to get around that. We might need four because of this. Well, we're going to need four because of the screws. But yeah. So let's consider maybe four standoffs. And then we're going to have our little end posts sticking out like that so that's the plan let's talk about materials as i said earlier in the video with the dry angle this is made out of a very thin plastic this is just the acrylic from a cd-rom um, disc case so a jewel case very thin plastic not very structural but with a small gyroscope like this works pretty well um and obviously aluminum is also an option um as i used it for the circular gyroscope you can also use thicker plastic like this. However, trying to use polycarb or something else, don't use acrylic because acrylic, especially when you machine it or whatnot, likes to break. And we're going to put forces on it like this. So that's going to put additional stress and torque on those points where you put the standoffs and stuff in. So uh, acrylic is a good material. It's not exactly the most structural or machinable material. A great option is printed circuit board material. So it is a uh, composite material, usually made out of fiberglass and an epoxy resin. And it's pretty tough, has little to no flex. So what I might do is I might use this for one of the gyroscopes. It's very lightweight, which is another feature. You wanna keep the gyroscope frame as light as possible. So I might use this. I might look for some cool circuit boards. You see you gonna take parts off, see what you can find. Uh, but the best of the best option I think we can put in our gyroscope is carbon fiber. Now this is a special piece of carbon fiber that is made for auto body work. And what makes it special is that it has this layer on the inside. So it's mostly air pockets with a hexagonal um, frame on the inside. And that gives us a lot of rigidity because um, it's a carbon fiber layer. Um, uh, mostly air layer and another carbon fiber layer on the bottom. So it gives us tension and it is very strong stuff. Like uh, very strong stuff. So it's definitely rigid. You're not going to snap that. So I, I think I'm going to build a gyroscope using this stuff. The downside to working with uh, composites like the carbon fiber or uh, the PCB, they cut very easy with a Dremel rotary tool, but the downside is whatever you get on you, like your skin or whatnot, can be very irritating. 
We got little carbon fiber uh, needles coming off the material here. Same thing with the fiberglass. So keep in mind that it might be irritating if you get it on your skin. Try and use a respirator. It's nasty stuff to work with. But yeah, we have options. So go ahead, start getting parts and making circles. As you can tell by the condition of the dry erase diagram, it's been a busy desk and significant progress has been made. So let me show you what I have. Ta-da. Look at that. Perfect. That's exactly what I was envisioning in my mind when I was drawing the dry erase diagram. So it's made out of printed circuit board. And it's also made out of a couple of screws and a couple of brass inserts that I've harvested from things over the years. Made myself a little hanging point here. If I can test it out. This uses a 60 gram flywheel. So how much does this weigh now? Let's see. 178 grams. So I've added about 120 grams of weight to this bugger. Oh, and I still need to add more. So let's get a weight on the three batteries. So about six grams a piece. 18 grams for three batteries. Okay. Um, so 18 plus. That's about 200 grams, plus a little bit more because I still need to add the wiring and I need to add the other end post with a point on it. So, uh, has all this been worth it? Will adding this much weight on the gyroscope have an impact on its performance? Will this even work at all? Go ahead and find that out actually. Uh, to do that, I'm going to simulate the weight of the added things with this bearing, 42 grams. So giving us 220-ish grams in total for the flywheel and uh, gyroscope assembly. Pull that off. Put that in there. And you can see, oh, that lines up very well. See, I took my time with this. It lines up very well. I'll go ahead and put that on. I did fumble a hole. Pretend like you didn't notice. Alright, so with that ball bearing in there, simulating the additional weight of everything, should be about 220. Oh, spot on, look at that. About, um, so yeah. Go ahead and uh, spin this up at the full voltage. Let's see if it'll even pick up. I'll grab a string here. It's a pretty heavy gyroscope. Put that in there. Okay. And we'll spin it up. I ain't even gonna kid you, man. Every time I hear a gyroscope go that fast, I get PTSD. I know the power that's stored in that flywheel. All right, go ahead and lift it. Will it work? Oh, look at that. It works really well. Quite impressive. Oh, yep, looks like uh, it'll function. Still obeys the laws of physics. Go ahead and uh, get the batteries and stuff kind of situated in there and get this one built. And then I'll go through a little bit more of the actual build process and other tips with the other gyroscope that I'm working on. Let's show you the progress made on that one. Uh, gyroscope. Yep. That one's made out of carbon fiber. Carbon fiber, uh, this stuff is about um, two thirds the weight of the PCB. So it's a much lighter material, as I said, stiffer too. I've got this one mounted on there. Pretty nicely, uh, pretty nicely balanced. So I got to uh, find standoffs and stuff to put this one together. Make two more carbon fiber discs, uh, once again, in the same kind of 
general configuration just a little bit wider. Yeah, coming together, great. So I'm gonna get this one all put together. We'll play around with it a little bit and then we'll go over some practical build tips if you're gonna build a gyroscope like this for yourself. It's time to reveal a completed gyroscope. Ta-da! It turned out beautifully. So, let's see what I've done. I have my three lithium ion polymer batteries right here. Switch here. Got my four connector charging terminal there. And yeah, that other thing looks fantastic. Let's go ahead and turn it on, test it out. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compare this one to the cheapo put together quick gyroscope here. The mass on this one's about 200 grams. Mass on this one's about 100. The flywheel weight about 50, so half the weight of this is the flywheel. Um, and uh, this one has a 60 gram flywheel, so about a third of the weight is flywheel mass on this one. So heavier frame in comparison to the flywheel. And the better the flywheel works, the slower the gyroscope will process. So I kind of want to get a rough idea how well this works. Now that it's up to speed, I'll let it go. And you can see if it works and processes. Okay, pretty good. Spinning a bit. Ah, it's hopping too. Okay, so need some balancing. Um, anyway, let's see how fast it processes. So, one, two, three, four, five, uh, between five and six. Okay, this thing is still quite visceral. Go ahead and spin this one up. Give the cheap gyroscope does better or worse. And I might be a little slower. One, two, three, four. But no, they're actually about the same speed. So as far as gyroscopes go, it works about the same. Functionally, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference between about an hour and a half and a cheap motor and unbalanced weight and about five, six hours of work and a lot more time and engineering gone into it as far as demonstrations go. Uh, this gyroscope, obviously it looks better. Uh, and doesn't sound like bees. Are you off? Are you on? I can't even tell it this one. I think it's off now. Anyway, so yeah, we have one more gyroscope to build and a lot of you like to see things being put together. So that's what I'm gonna do now. So we're gonna go through real engineering with this and now finish this gyroscope off. At this point, I have two more pieces of carbon fiber to start manufacturing uh, machining processes on. I've already got a rough circle cut out here, and I've got the center point mark. So we're going to go ahead and take these on the drill press, drill a hole inside, clamp them together, put them on the lathe, spin them so they're nice and round, and then start to mark off where the screws and everything need to go for the screws and standoff, everything else. So, yeah, let's get the hands dirty. Let's get the machining. Let's start drilling. In order to do that, turn on the drill press. Here we go, and we're gonna drill those center holes out nice and neat. Carefully, and this stuff cuts like butter. I think we can make that work. Let's go ahead and mount these on the lathe. All right, now I have the two pieces of carbon fiber mounted on the lathe, and we're gonna spin them down into perfect discs. Now, even though this carbon fiber has a high tensile strength, it's hard to bend, its compression uh, capabilities aren't that great because it has that mostly air core. So I have this and another piece in the back to evenly support the compressive forces of the screw that I'm using to hold it into the chuck a little bit more. Let's go ahead, spin it up and uh, make some circles. And that looks pretty good. So now I gotta do, I'm gonna run a file over the outside here. I got these little carbon 
fiber uh, bristle sticking off the side of the discs. Let's go ahead and knock those off real quick. Yeah, that looks good. All right, let's take these off the lathe and see how they look. Looks pretty good to me. I think those will do just fine. Oh yeah. All right, we have two discs. Look at that. Nice and shiny. Assuming you already have discs and you want to put some holes in there so you can put them all together, we're going to talk about figuring out where to put holes. So, if you have two larger discs, you're going to want to put three holes in there to hold those together, but you also got to put four holes in each of these discs to clamp those together. So, where are you going to put them? How do you figure this out? You do a whole bunch of math and whatnot, but there are easier ways to do it. Well, let's talk about that. Now, I find putting four holes in something like this to be actually pretty easy. It's just a simple tool. All you need is pretty much a caliper and some kind of stencil or whatnot to use as a reference. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a circle on there like this. And then carefully scribe in there like that. Well, it's pretty simple to do. Uh, if you don't have the calipers, you can uh, figure out something creative. But, you know, two points shouldn't be all too difficult. So now we're going to put four holes. Well, I grab a stencil like this. And I'm going to kind of center it up on there as, uh, as much as I can. Does that look center? Yeah, that's pretty close. Okay, now, holding that down, I'm going to go ahead and mark it. Like so. There, just like that. And uh, if you're wondering how I did the the uh, three holes, just use a stencil like this. It works really well. Plus, a lot of these will give you good center. But what about if you don't have a center that's easy to get to? Uh, for example, you can't really put a calipers or anything else in there. Well, you can also measure from the outside, figure out where you need to put your marks. So let's show you know how to do that and uh, you just go along the outside and uh, scribe like this oops you go all the way around and you'll get some nice good marks like that so very easy to kind of mark out where you want your holes to go keep everything nice and center regardless of which way you tackle it. Let's go ahead and do that now on this disc here. We're going to need something about this same size, so go ahead and do that. Now, of course, we're going to go a little deeper, so yeah, bring it like that, see where that gets us. Let's bring it in a little bit more. careful that I don't muck up the carbon fiber all too much. Uh-huh. Right. And then stencil. Now, this is actually the side that the batteries are going to go in, so i got to keep that in mind. Oh, that's one of the 
post so the batteries are going to come in this way it's going to be laid down flat like that so go ahead and line that up like that actually all right so now i got to go ahead and cut all four of those holes out very carefully can't be as crazy as i could with the center hole for the smaller discs everything needs to line up pretty well so i'll go ahead and do that and then we'll hopefully be able to put everything together at this point all the machining i need to do for the gyroscope is done so we can start assembling the whole thing now i want to go over real quick what i've done already i've already attached this bottom plate to the plate that holds the brushless motor with the four standoffs eight screws i also epoxied the screws that hold that plate on on this side by the flywheel that way i can take this piece off and service it and i did the same with this side here um, just because i don't want those screws to get loose especially because they're inside not the easiest to access well uh this goes on uh pretty nicely i have my keys here there we go so that goes on like like show uh, and then I have this piece right here with my key tolerances, you know, uh, that'll go on like this. And uh, so what we need to do now is uh, install the batteries and the electronicals. Oh, before that, I just want to let you know, uh, if you can't find standoffs like this, you can always use screws like I've done here uh, with nuts or, you know, harvested things. Or you can use these little uh, standoff posts that you can pull from. Uh, the connectors on laptops, video cards, and stuff. So there's uh, a lot of options there. Uh, anyway, let's go over the basic wiring. As I said, I'm going to use uh, three batteries again because these are 12-volt motors, and each battery gives me about 4 volts when it's fully charged up. Let's go ahead and drop our batteries out here. So one battery... Two batteries, three batteries, and we're gonna put uh, negative on this side. And we're gonna go ahead and draw positive on that side. And I'm gonna be wiring these batteries up in series. Now that means that each battery that provides four volts, so we're gonna write a four on here. We're gonna join them together in a link. So we're gonna take the negative from one side and draw it over like this and same thing for this one and then if you measure uh, between the two outsides you'll get 12 volts go ahead and draw a 12 volt output so that's one side that's the other side here uh, and then we got to do something with the power so go ahead draw the motor And then we're going to have a connection here. And we can just take the connection from the negative side of the motor. Just join it directly like that to the battery. But on the positive side, we got to put a switch in. So we're going to take that side, bring it on down like that, go like this. And then we're going to draw a little contact like that. And that's going to be our switch. Now we also need to be able to charge the batteries. So how do we do that? Well... I use a four pin connector and many uh, three cell lithium ion polymer batteries use the same thing. So let's go ahead and draw our connector here. So just like that. And then we're going to draw four pins. So what I'm doing is I'm connecting them up like they usually do. We're going to start with say the negative side here we're going to connect the negative uh, side to that first pin like that and then these two links we're going to connect to the two inner ones just like this and then we're going to have one more that goes from the positive side to that last link and so that gives us our tap so we can use for a charger and each one of these taps will be the same as on the batteries so for example this one will be um, positive on the outside this will be a negative we can write this as our zero volt write that one as our 12 
And then from there, we will have four, eight volts. Now, uh, between each one of these, you have a positive and a negative. So you can either use a three cell charger or you can use two of the, any of the pins to charge uh, your batteries individually, which is uh, what I'm doing in this case. So for example, if I uh, wanna charge this battery, I plug it into these two. And if I wanna charge this battery, plug it into these two and so on and so forth. And uh, that's how that works. So this is the schematic, the way I'm gonna wire it up. And that's what I did with uh, this one right here. So very easy. So let's go ahead and start with the electronics. All right, you're ready to finish up a gyroscope? I am. So let's go ahead and do that. I have my battery pack all put together. If you're installing batteries like this, I recommend that you use some masking tape. So that way, if you glue them in, you can also remove them. Don't directly glue down the batteries. Uh, you don't have to use batteries exactly like this. In fact, you can use several different types of batteries. So for example, you probably use batteries like this and it would accomplish the exact same task. Just make sure that they're relatively balanced. You could also probably stack multiple cells that are thin on top of one another. As long as you got the wiring correct, you'll be good. So I have my plug for charging, my three batteries, and my switch, everything's in there, and the switch isn't epoxied and still works, so it looks all ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and start making my connections on this side. I'm gonna do the uh, the two battery terminals in the middle, and that way I can bring the motor wire and the negative together. And then I'm also gonna do the one for the positive because this is gonna get connected to the switch, and then from the other side of the switch out to the motor positive wire. So let's go ahead and do that. Zoom in, that way you can see what I'm doing. It's down all nice and neat. Here you go. And let's get powdering. So after this is done, uh, we can go ahead and do some gyroscope experiments. Honestly, I don't know that much about gyroscopes, so I could be completely wrong about that whole uh, procession thing being uh, slower if it's a more effective gyroscope. Pretty sure it has to do with, you know, how far out from the center of axis the uh, point of leverage is on the gyroscope. All sorts of other things. But uh, we can go ahead and check out some of the differences between the gyroscopes and compare them once they're all done and put together. I also intend to make these things capable of being mountable on different things. So for example, I'll show you that real quick. I'm leaving some screw threads on the end so that way I can screw them into things and mount them. And that way right there, is it positive? Well, I remember um, if you're not familiar with using lithium-ion polymers or you don't have a proper battery charger and are just using what you can find, um, watch for the protected lithium-ion cells. So have a little circuit board right here. But yeah, um, these can be a massive fire hazard. So if you're inexperienced, try and use protected cells, not unprotected ones like I'm using. All right, so that's done. Now I can take this and put it on top of the gyroscope and connect the motor up. The negative side comes through these. Right here, and the positive side comes through these. Right here. Now, I'm gonna make another recommendation here. You have the longer wires. 
you have the urge to make the wires shorter so they can go cleanly to where they need to go like this but you don't want to do that in this case because if you do then you can't pull this apart because you don't have the wire slack so keep a fair bit of length in the wire so that way you can lift this up and open the gyroscope if you need to do some maintenance on it or balancing or whatnot so I'm gonna go ahead and probably leave what's on there cut maybe a half an inch off on that side and then loop that around yeah go ahead and cut about an inch off that end Now I gotta connect this wire and this wire to the negative battery terminal right there. Battering is much more difficult when you have a camera where you need to be. Right, that looks pretty good. Come over here and connect this side up now. Turn off the switch. One second. And right, so it should be good to go. Go ahead and flip a switch to see if we get power. There it goes. Yeah. All right, cool, cool. So what I'm gonna do now, is I'm gonna do a little wire management on the top because if this thing starts spinning around, it's gonna wanna fling the wires out due to the, I think what, centrifugal force? Centripetal force, it's one of those. I'm not a gyroscope expert. So before I do all this, what I should do is put some hot glue down in the battery tab so they don't touch either. Precautions, precautions, precautions. Thumbs up if you can smell this video. All right, and now one last piece, just to help hold everything together a little bit more. It's a piece of foam, and then when the uh, top gets put on, the top will hold that together, add some compression force to the wires and tape, and uh, give a little bit more stability. So, what side do I want? I think that's the side I want. So, go ahead and screw this together. Do that in fast speed up video form. All right, that's it. No, it's not. Those are gonna help.
Oh, I bet that was painful for some of you to watch. There, now, now it's actually done. So, let's go ahead and try it out. I don't know how charged it is, but it does spin. Yeah, and I just said it does spin, and now it ain't gonna spin. There it goes. It's gotta be the motor soft spark. Now start. Remember when I said earlier in the video that some motors don't like to start up when they have a lot of mass? That's exactly what I mean. Some motors don't like to start up when they have a lot of mass. Okay, here's the mass. How much does this bugger weigh? It's fairly balanced, so uh, the fact that it's spinning shouldn't really change anything on the scale. The fact that it's trying to roll away definitely does. We'll check the weight later. We'll see how it spins now. Alright, this seems a little heavier. I have my doubts, to be honest. Okay, you know what? I shouldn't have my doubts. That thing is quite heavy. I want to say it's about one-third-ish heavier than the other one, but the balance on it is much better. It's almost astonishing. Go ahead and turn that off. Let it spin down. Let's we'll check the balance on it real quick. That's gorgeous. You couldn't get better accidentally. I uh, can still get it a little bit better by uh, putting some weights and whatnot on it, but anyway, uh, what is the weight? 255 grams. Okay, so this weighs 50 grams heavier than the other one. Uh, let's say uh, 80 gram flywheel versus the 60 gram ish flywheel, about 55 grams actually. So 25 grams uh, more in the flywheel, 25 grams more in the frame. That's the rough size comparison. Yeah. I'm going to go charge this up, think of uh, some creative gyroscope experiments we can do, and we're going to come back and do them. Also discuss a little bit more about some design considerations that I've learned making these, some other tips that I can hopefully pass along to you. So that way you can make your own DIY gyroscope a little easier. For my first gyroscope experiment, I want to see if you can stack processing gyroscopes or hang them, kind of like a mobile. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can put this gyroscope on here and uh, then maybe hook this gyroscope on the end. Uh, physics says it's possible. So we're going to go ahead and try that out. Whether I have enough power in the gyroscopes to do that is a whole nother thing. So I'm going to go ahead and start the gyroscopes up. Take a little while to spin up. Uh, yeah. Okay, we're going to set that one on there like this. Yeah, that seems to work. Now we're going to put another string on the uh, other end of that gyroscope then. Like that. And uh, I'm going to hang this on the hook of the loop. That one. So i got two gyroscopes now. Uh, and i got a foam uh, mat. Because I don't know if they're going to really stay up or whatnot. Probably should give it a little bit more of an angle. Just to give it the best of luck here. In three, two, one. Wow, that works. I did not expect that to work, honestly, but uh, there it goes. And you can stack gyroscopes. That's neat. <laughs> oh, that's unexpected, actually. Right, uh, on to the next gyroscope test. This one obviously passes. Now that I have seen two gyroscopes linked together in processing, of course you gotta try three now. I do have my genuine doubts about this actually working, but we're gonna go ahead and give it a try anyway. Uh, I'm gonna link these two gyroscopes together. 
and see if uh, these even work. And that one's processing. Uh, let's see if I can drop this one and uh, if it still works. Mind you, there's about now 500 grams on there. I, I think it's going to come crashing down, honestly. Oh, yeah. It really is. There's not enough power in that gyroscope to hold it in place. Earlier in the video, I also discussed that I want to be able to mount the gyroscope to things, but it also allows us to study the gyroscope in other ways. Like, for example, what changes on the gyroscope happen if you move the point where you hang it out further? Well, let's go ahead and find out. So, I'm going to move it out uh, about uh, that far away. Actually, we're going to keep it here. And uh, we're going to see how it processes close to the gyro. Go ahead and speed it up. I'm going to let it go and we're going to see how it works. Okay, so my guess is that if we move it out further, it's probably not going to work as well. Ah yes, masking tape. It sticks to itself and nothing else. Uh, let's move it out about that far, see what changes we get on the gyroscope. Hmm, not much, honestly. Go ahead and move it out even further. I think it's going to start to sag pretty badly out this far away from the flywheel. Only the only way to tell is to let it happen. Looks to be processing a little faster. Alright, so that means that if we add more probably get even faster procession. Now of course it's center isn't actually uh, true because the chain moves as well. It's not a fixed point but put that on there. Remove this out. I hope they made those bearings on a, on a Wednesday. All right, see what happens now. I think it's going to go even faster if it doesn't just fall over right away. That does kind of both. All right, let's uh, let put some mass on that side. Let's see what happens. And we're not learning all too much, are we? Go ahead and put a mass on the other side. See what we get. Can we balance this out so it stops processing completely? I think we can. So that seems to be the heavier side. About there, yeah. Okay. Alright, so that's about perfect. So, if I set a little bit of mass on there, on this side, will it start processing? By now, it should. Not very fast. Add some more mass on that side. Looks like it wants to go clockwise. There it goes. Uh, it's going to slow down. If I pick this up, I'll just stop right away. Interesting. Coming back. Probably just upset the balance a little bit. Let's stop. That's interesting. Okay, so let's try something now. Let's stop processing. We're going to put another weight on there. We're going to see if it does a full rotation. Ah, science difficult. Uh, see if it does a full rotation. We're going to tape that on there and see if it does a full rotation.
And then what I'm going to do is I'm not going to stop the gyroscope, but I am going to remove the weight. I want to see if it comes back and stops where it was before or it falls to pieces. Please hold, we're having technical difficulties. The technical difficulties have been solved and I got the gyroscope now balanced with my uh, counterweight on the other side. I'm gonna, we're going to go ahead and continue with that experiment. So, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to put the weight on the gyroscope, we're going to see what happens. And it processes counterclockwise. Let's see, about one and a half rotations and I'm going to take it off. That processes clockwise. Not as much, but here's the question. Why is it that when I put the weight on it, like this, why doesn't it continue to process? Why is it at one point it stops processing? See what I mean? Why doesn't it continue to spin around? Well, let me explain what's going on a little bit. So to do that, I'm going to actually stop the gyroscope. And I'm going to rebalance it. Now we got to consider that the gyroscope will only process when there is a force applied um, on the axis. So up and down like this. Um, when there isn't a force, it won't process. So what's going on is the additional force, when I put the weight on it, will want to cause the gyroscope to go down. Procession will kick in and will make it process one way until it finds its balance point. Now once it's balanced, there's no more torque applied to the gyroscope and no reason for it to process anymore. However, when I take the weight off, well, now we have a torque applied to the gyroscope and that torque comes from the weight wanting to pull it down or in this case, push the gyroscope upwards, which is an opposite torque. So now we have a torque that'll move us um, the other way, would be what, clockwise, uh, back to where it was. So that's what's going on. Now the interesting thing about precession versus uh, gravity is that gravity is a, an acceleration force. Uh, it's a constant force of what? Uh, I think 9.86 meters per second per second. So that means for every second that you fall, you gain an additional 9.86 meters per second. However, we don't have a constant acceleration force that can be easily seen with the gyroscopes. I'm gonna go ahead and put this gyroscope on there. Now you'll notice that the precession is pretty much constant. So it doesn't get faster and faster and faster and faster. So why is it that this stays at the same uh, relative velocity as it goes around in circles and it doesn't gain any velocity, it doesn't have any acceleration to it? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, and I think that what we're looking at is that same constant force giving it a constant torque going around. Now because it's a constant force, it's not going to go any faster, but we do have losses and whatnot. It's weird conservation of angular momentum stuff. Not a gyroscope expert, but it's just interesting to note the difference between gyroscopic precession and the acceleration force with gravity. Um, while we're at it, let's see also if the flywheel speed does actually change uh, the precession speed, which I think it does. I'm going to go ahead and let this go. Yeah, that's pretty slow. Uh, I'm going to wait till this kind of slows down. Add friction. All right, it's it's significantly slower, but will it be faster as it processes? I think it will be. A little quicker, I think. Wait till it slows down quite a bit. I'm rocking it because it adds additional force on the bearings. Okay, now it's pretty slow. Will it process even quicker? Oh yeah. So the faster the flywheel is going, the slower it will process, just like as I thought in the video. Anyway, the last thing I'm going to do is wrap up with a couple more tips uh, and go over why I didn't use any of the three-phase motors. And that's it. The video will be long enough and done. So what did we learn about gyroscopes in this video? Well, I learned that these little three-phase CD-ROM motors are still a terrible option to use for a DIY gyroscope. Not only do they need a fancy three-phase uh, controller, 
uh, ESC, but they also suffer from a structural problem that I discussed earlier, and that has to do with the way that the rotor assembly is constructed. So much like this one, uh, if there's any kind of side torquing, it'll get loose and simply lose its structural integrity. So similar thing happened when I tried to pull the plastic CD-ROM clamping mechanism off the top of this one. You can see that that pin, that shaft is uh, really loose in there. Now it has no structural support. So that's what I mean by you know how they get loose and kind of fall apart. Let's talk about gyroscope optimization real quick. The first thing to optimize is not only your motor wattage and performance, but to make sure that your flywheel doesn't have too much mass to overload your bearings and wear those out. Ball bearings, once again, are the best. Uh, the more you can reduce the vibration on your flywheel, the easier it will be on the bearings too, because they don't have to deal with the constant shaking force. Uh, in order to find your flywheel balance point and get that correct, you can either uh, try to work real hard and center it, like I did, or you can add and subtract mass as needed. To find out where to put your weight or remove your weight, you can always use like clay or plastic, um, something uh, like wax you can put on there temporarily, just kind of get a feel for where you need to add that mass. Uh, same thing applies for the frame of the gyroscope if you want to get that a little bit better. Another thing to note is you probably want to make the frame of your gyroscope as light as you possibly can. Now that does have its down you know, downfalls, especially with the power gyroscope, because you got to deal with the torquing, uh, the torquing force of the motor. So kind of like in a helicopter, the gyroscope gets pushed one way, the flywheel gets pushed one way, the case gets pushed the other way. So having too little weight will also make the, the frame of the gyroscope, the case spin quicker. So there's upsides and downsides. You also probably want to try to optimize how close your uh, hanging point or your uh, balancing point is to the flywheel that'll help with balance as well as trying to balance out the frame itself but uh, yeah other than that you know you can see that there's options you know you can build your own gyroscope you know there's options engineering is about overcoming the deficits that we have that's why necessity is the mother of invention innovation sorry imagination might be the father of innovation but necessity is the mother of invention so this is better than no gyroscope keep that in mind i'm gonna wrap up the video now with my final test and that involves using the larger gyroscope that i put together so just like earlier in the video i had two gyroscopes in a row um, linked and processing i want to see if this third gyroscope can support two more gyroscopes just like you can support this channel by the link below it keeps the sponsor segments free and limits the ads that I put on. So it's a win-win. But we're going to try and hang three gyroscopes together, see if they process. I think if that happens, it'll be a real cool way to end this video. There are many industries that use flywheels for various applications, such as in the aeronautics industry, where flywheels are used for the artificial horizon in aircraft. Um, they use them for reaction wheels and robots for making the move and hold position. Satellites use them in similar fashions, as well as to hold a particular axis, and they're even used for storing large amounts of energy. In fact, there have been even vehicles that are powered by stored energy in flywheels. But I'm going to use them to show you my poor self-preservation instinct. So let's go ahead and start spinning up some gyroscopes and see if we can hang three procession gyroscopes in a row. Uh, spin up this gyroscope here, the big one. It's going to take a couple of... Uh, couple of seconds it is a large gyroscope we're going to start these gyroscopes up here uh, let's see if we can pull the rabbit out of the hat so more and more and more and more and more maybe we can switch these to battery real quick faster 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 this is not what I want to be doing but it's in the name of science All right, so we have that gyroscope going. We're gonna hang it up. It should process rather nicely. Hopefully everything stays where it should be. Yes, it does. Okay, we're gonna set the other flywheels up, or uh, other gyroscopes up now. Man, this is... Pick that one up, all right. 
Can we do three? Will this be a huge mistake? This is why I have padding underneath. One, two, three. Look at that. Three processing periscopes at once. And that's the kind of entertainment you get on Beardly Don. With that being said, as always, thanks for watching and stay tuned for more.